Welcome everyone here in Darwin. Uh, I'll start on time. So my name's David Thomas. I work with Liam Greeley, who's going to give our seminar today on housing repairs and maintenance. Um, but before we begin, um, I'll acknowledge that we are here on Larrakia country and acknowledge elders. I mean, really, this work on housing is so important because you know, poor quality housing is a reason why many Aboriginal people um, have trouble staying on their country. So um, it is um, so important that we know more about housing uh, and indeed housing policy. So I'm really looking forward to Liam's seminar. So welcome, Liam. Um, thanks, David, and thanks, Patty. Um, I'd also, can you hear me up the back? Um, I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the Larrakia people, the traditional owners and custodians on the land I'm speaking from today. I pay my respects to past and present Larrakia elders, as well as to the First Nations people on whose country this research has taken place for their efforts to respond to ongoing occupation on land where sovereignty was never ceded. I'm just going to time myself. Um, so thank you all for joining us today in the room and online. Um, by way of an introduction, I began working at Menzies on the Healthy Homes Evaluation in July 2021 with David Thomas. Uh, and since that time, I've worked part-time at both Menzies and at the Housing for Health Incubator at the University of Sydney. Um, at the incubator with Tess Lee and others, uh, our work examines the impacts of underinvestment, inattention and neglect in the governance of regional and remote housing and essential services infrastructure. As a humanities trained ethnographer of policy making and unfurling, I'm interested in the bureaucratic and service delivery tech ecologies that produce housing dysfunction. And more positively, what's required to sustainably deliver the housing and infrastructure needed by householders. Repairs and maintenance is central to this story of poor housing outcomes, where the construction and design sectors provide definitions for sustainable housing. These typically focus on front end design standards and construction materials. Limited consideration is given to what's required once occupancy begins and houses start to disassemble. Housing's materiality is dynamic and entropic. Breakdown is inevitable and ongoing repairs and maintenance is necessary to hold things together. In remote Indigenous communities in Australia, reactive approaches to property maintenance dominate over preventive attention, leaving houses in various states of disrepair. Um, I'm conscious that there will be uh, varying degrees of familiarity here with asset management practices. Um, so before I turn to the Healthy Homes evaluation, I want to very briefly describe a program I examined in this Uhuru research with that team um, to provide a point of comparison to keep in mind. So briefly, on the APY lands in Northwest South Australia, 371 houses across 10 communities are managed by the South Australian Housing Trust. A head contractor is contracted jointly by Housing SA and the Department of Infrastructure and Transport to deliver property, you're right, property maintenance services for a period of seven years. Property maintenance programs are commonly characterised as cyclical, planned or responsive or reactive. Most programs are predominantly responsive. Something is fixed once it's reported as broken with a small cyclical component, anything from a smoke alarm check upwards. Tradespeople's travel costs is often a significant proportion of remote housing maintenance budgets, more so where there's more responsive or reactive work. Emergency maintenance, obviously very expensive. On the APY lands, a responsive maintenance program is augmented by planned maintenance according to a schedule of works. This includes 10 visits annually by tradespeople for plumbing, electrical, air conditioning, building fabric and pest control work, with additional services such as septic tank desludging uh, and deep cleaning scheduled biannually and intermittently. Housing SA maintenance coordinators audit the work of the head contractor, and alongside this preventive maintenance program, APY lands houses benefit from an environmental health program run by the Aboriginal Community Controlled Organisation, Nanapa Health Council, 
uh, with works including the installation and repair of washing machines, uh, slashing grass, cleaning yards, and so on. In 2019, Housing SA spent about $10,000 per house on maintenance. In the Northern Territory, the NT government is the landlord of about 5,500 houses across 73 remote communities, excluding government employee housing and 416 town camp and community living area houses. The proportion of overcrowded housing is 54.7%. As at 31st December 2022, there were 5,053 general and priority applications on the NT's public housing wait list, with a total of 213 allocations made in the 2022 calendar year and wait times upwards of 10 years in some regions. Remote community housing in the Northern Territory is funded under the National Partnership for Remote Housing Northern Territory between the Commonwealth and NT governments. The NTG committed 1.1 billion over 10 years from 2018, while the Australian government committed 550 million over five years in 2018 to construct 1,950 bedrooms or the equivalent of 650 three bedroom houses, according to a milestone schedule. $35 million is budgeted per annum for remote repairs and maintenance. In 2017, the Commonwealth's review of the National Partnership Agreement on Remote Indigenous Housing stated that 2,700 new remote houses are required in the NT by 2028 to reduce crowding to 25 to 30% of all remote community houses. That's a conservative estimate of houses that's exceeded in, in other places, including by the government. So some back of the envelope, costing suggests the following. If we take a conservative 700,000 average cost of a three bedroom remote community house build, then the total remote housing program budget, less the maintenance allocation, would generate about 264 houses per year or 2,640 houses from 2018 to 2088, 2028. Once funding is also allocated from that program to government employee housing and new build milestone targets are not met, which they haven't been, this best result, crowding at 25 to 30% of housing, is untenable. So that is, despite headline dollar figures, there's still structural underinvestment in remote community housing in the Territory by the Commonwealth. For remote householders, the housing crisis is endemic rather than episodic, and the best case outcome of government funding commitments as they exist is, is continuing under supply. So I think this is important context for evaluating any discrete and time-bounded program. And to that end, the NT government's remote housing program is named Our Community, Our Futures, Our Home. It has four main components home build or new construction, room to breathe, housing refurbishment and extensions, government employee housing and repairs and maintenance or healthy homes. From the NTG's perspective, healthy homes aims to represent a new approach to repairs and maintenance in remote housing. Compared with previous approaches to remote community r and repairs and maintenance, the objectives of healthy homes include an increased emphasis on r and that will improve residents' capacity to enact healthy living practices as defined by not-for-profit not company Health Habitat, a greater emphasis on planned maintenance rather than responsive repairs, and a prioritization of Aboriginal businesses and corporations to deliver repair and maintenance services. Menzies was contracted by the Department of Territory Families, Housing and Communities to monitor and evaluate the Healthy Homes Program. This has been a processual evaluation with feedback on healthy homes provided to the department and to the project's expert advisory group, uh, which includes land councils, Aboriginal community housing providers and Aboriginal housing NT, as the program has been implemented. The original intention was that this would be a two-stage evaluation with phase one focused on program implementation and phase two focused on measuring the health impacts of the new program. Um, due to various program delays and issues, which I'll refer to the proposed phase two Will not proceed. Published in 2020, the Healthy Homes Program Guidelines describe four main program components. First, the rollout of Housing for Health projects at remote communities delivered by Health Habitat. Second, the integration of healthy living practices into new remote housing maintenance services contracts 
and tenancy management support services contracts, capacity building and education, especially focused on community-based behaviour change programs around housing and hygiene, and monitoring and evaluation. So although this evaluation project began around my employment by David in July 2021, um, it's experienced various delays reflecting program delivery. The 2020 NT Labor Party victory initiated machinery of government changes that resulted in a major restructure of the Department of Territory Families, Housing and Communities and the Department of Infrastructure Planning and Logistics. So the Healthy Homes Program managed by Territory Families, Housing and Communities has subsequently involved overseeing housing maintenance contracts, which is superintended by staff inside DICL. Practically, this restructure delayed the tendering and award of maintenance and tenancy contracts until late 2021 and into 2022, with end dates of those contracts corresponding to the end of the current agreement, which is until it's been extended June 30 of this year. COVID-19 delayed the rollout of some housing for health projects by Health Habitat with border controls and viral outbreaks restricting the entry of some interstate project managers, so they were back on track soon after. Um, and David and I also experienced delays accessing program data. Uh, we received access to relevant expenditure and work order data sets in November of last year. And Junyi Su, with support from Steve, Steve Guthridge, has been undertaking quantitative analysis of relevant data systems, as next, CBIS, in the past couple of months. So I'll make some brief comments about Housing for Health and the community education components of Healthy Homes before focusing on the remote housing maintenance services contracts. Many of you will be familiar with Housing for Health, Health Habitat's licensed methodology for fixing houses according to its nine healthy living practices and an ethic of no survey without service. Healthy Homes, the program, has subcontracted Health Habitat to deliver about three Housing for Health projects a year at various remote communities and are maintaining houses for Better Health Project with Tunnandura Council at our Springstown camps. Since 2021, this has involved NTG funded projects at Amangara, Warangara, Canteen Creek, Husk Bluff and our Springstown camps with consultations underway elsewhere. Housing for Health is already a reputable and proven methodology the repetition of survey fix events to determine and following capital works upgrades provides an audit of the maintenance required in project houses. Housing for Health has demonstrated significant improvements in the function of housing where projects have been delivered and provides an indicative audit of the wider stock in the Northern Territory. The key point to emphasise is that while Housing for Health projects make significant improvements in the context where they operate, this is a small proportion of total NT remote communities. In other words, the success or otherwise of, health, of housing for health projects should not be the focal point of evaluating healthy homes overall. Similarly, the Menzies evaluation was tasked with examining the tenancy management support services contracts. So specifically, this included the Living Strong program, which service providers were contracted to deliver to remote housing tenants. Living Strong has sought to integrate an understanding of healthy living practices, so the ability to wash oneself and one's children, the ability to wash clothes and bedding, the ability to store and prepare food, etc., into tenancy support in the form of a six-module program to be delivered as a service provider determines appropriate. Unlike the housing maintenance services contracts where any work that you do as a contractor will be evident through the submission of an invoice to the government, Tenancy management support services contracts fund community housing officer positions. So there's been very limited use by service providers of the department's TMS tasking system to record the delivery of Living Strong. Um, and there's thus scant quantitative data on the program. My interviews with service providers have found significant variability in terms of whether Living Strong was being delivered and what it entailed. The program was appropriately flexible, um, but this has meant it's been applied inconsistently. It's not mandatory for householders as this would be discriminatory. Some reports are positive about the support it's provided to householders, 
while others emphasize the systemic and household level impediments to achieving program goals. So the most important component of healthy homes is the housing maintenance services contracts. This is what happens everywhere. Healthy homes sought to replace a prior arrangement under which remote community housing received maintenance services under both a trade panel and a housing maintenance coordinator contract. So under the trade panel model established in 2013, large tenders for big clusters of communities would result in multiple contracts for different trades companies. In this cluster, you might have a plumbing company, electrical, carpentry, and so on. You might have multiple of each. By contrast, Healthy Homes has sought to establish contracts specific to one or two communities awarded to Aboriginal businesses or community controlled organisations, which could themselves subcontract works as required. In some ways, this looks more akin to um, community housing, Aboriginal community housing providers in New South Wales and their relationship with Aboriginal housing office. Providers have had different experiences of this tendering process and these contracts summarized in our report. One limitation is their relative short length. Following the delays described above and the end date of the national funding agreement, maintenance contractor contracts were awarded for between 22 and 15 months, subsequently extended. This is a short period to establish reliable service provision for inexperienced providers and to deliver a profitable program following setup costs. Similarly, some providers reported issues with the value of contracts, which required costing individual items on the schedule of rates to cover all of preliminaries, overheads, and on costs, including travel expenses. So incomplete schedules of rates, where unscheduled works could not claim originally agreed upon cost indexing, meant companies could not always recoup the cost of maintenance work. Similarly, there was no guaranteed minimum of work under the contracts, no accounting for inflation, nor a presumption that the awarded supplier would have preference for contract renewal. Such contracting issues, I think, are rarely identified in media commentaries on state housing neglect or in academic treaties on the need for more housing for better health outcomes. But getting such details right, recognising the true cost of remote housing maintenance, and the administrative conditions facilitating or impeding service delivery is centrally important to expanding and sustaining the role played by Aboriginal community control organisations in remote housing management. The chief feature that differentiated healthy homes contracts from the prior trade model, remote maintenance, trade panel remote maintenance model, and which underpinned its claim as a preventive maintenance program was the requirement that contracted service providers undertake annual inspections of all their properties using a condition assessment tool. This is a cyclical inspection mechanism designed to generate preventive maintenance work. And I'll return to that below. So one of the main achievements of Healthy Homes has been the award of contracts to Aboriginal business enterprises and corporations. 31 contracts for housing maintenance services were awarded to 22 companies, including 25 contracts to 17 ABEs. These contracts cover 49 remote communities, Alice Springs Town Camps and Tennant Creek community living areas. Similarly, 25 contracts for tenancy management support services have been awarded to 18 companies, including 19 contracts to 15 ABEs. This, cover, this covers 47 remote communities, our Springs Town Camps and Tenant Creek community living areas. Our report discusses various issues with both the form of the condition assessment tool and the inspection process. Most pertinently, very few service providers appear to have met the requirement to conduct preventive inspections using the condition assessment tool each year. So data analyzed for our interim report published October 2022, showed 137 invoices for CAT inspections, equivalent to about 3% of total housing stock, total remote housing stock. There's a question, therefore, about the extent to which the remote maintenance model established under healthy homes is distinct from the old model. Where tenancy management support services contracts have not been awarded in 26 communities, 
the department has remained responsible for all tenancy services. Where housing maintenance services contracts have not been awarded in 24 communities, the old trade panel model has continued to function, albeit without the prior housing maintenance coordinator contracts in most instances. So where healthy homes, housing maintenance services contracts have been established, maintenance expenditure is similar under the prior and healthy homes programs. However, it's not possible within NTG data sets to distinguish between responsive repairs and preventive maintenance works generated by undertaking condition assessment tool inspections. The non-completion of condition assessment tool inspections compounds the lack of baseline data the government and housing managers have about individual house condition and function. This is partly an effect of the inadequate metrics that govern property maintenance under consecutive national funding agreements and partly a matter of data collection and integration within the NTG. Where CAT inspections have been done, it's not clear that this information, as with the results of Housing for Health surveys, is being incorporated into any data set about the condition of remote community housing. So there's an opportunity to do that. Uh, we will publish our final evaluation report in early July. Um, looking ahead, future iterations of the remote housing maintenance program are likely to be impacted by at least, I think, three things which I could speak to as required. Um, those being ongoing litigation relating to the habitability standard under the Residential Tenancies Act, the expansion of the Aboriginal community housing sector in remote communities, and the establishment of the next Commonwealth NTG funding agreement. Um, following the completion of this project, uh, David and I are currently working on the terms for an evaluation of the new Homelands Housing and Infrastructure Program, so I'm happy to speak to that. Um, and that program is a result of the $100 million funding allocation by the Commonwealth to Northern Territory Homelands, the first such funding granted since 2012. Thank you.